Okay, I guess we're starting. Are we starting? Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, I'm going to get on to uh, probably mainly the tropics, actually. Um, a lot of it will be theory they hardly sell. It's kind of the opening act. You know, rock bands have a main attraction, and then they have an opening act. So I'm kind of the opening act, and the main attraction starts. Uh, well, next week, I guess, is the big main attraction for many people. Monsoons, um, and Simona will talk about monsoons tomorrow. So I'll give you a bit of background theory, hopefully for understanding that. Um, but before I do that, I wanted to show you a couple of movies which aren't related to my talk, but they're actually very cool movies, uh, which I did not make. So here's one. This is uh, actually model results. It's the ocean circulation. It's the absolute velocities of uh, a big kitchen sink ocean model. Uh, called Orca, which is a, a European model, uh, or Nemo. And uh, white is, is fast, and blue is slow, and you can just see. I guess there are two things. The scales of the motion are pretty small. Here's the Crocio, here's the Gulf Stream, breaks up. Lots and lots of eddies all over the place. Eddies with a scale of a few hundred kilometers. Is it working? Yes, but it can get you video the recordings. Thank you. OK. Um, so it's very pretty. Uh, I won't talk about the ocean at all today. Um, <laughs> but it seemed like a nice thing to show. And then the really interesting thing is uh, the next movie, which superposes the atmosphere on top of it. So you can actually we'll now see the atmosphere. It's a coupled model. And what we'll see is the precipitation uh, field of the atmosphere uh, superposed on the ocean. So here it is. There's the precip field. And there's two things to note. Uh, first off, the scale of the atmosphere is much larger. Uh, you can see these precipitation bands, which don't often go over Trieste. Uh, are much larger than the, than the oceanic scales, uh, and they're actually much faster than the, than the ocean scale. The ocean is actually moving in this. It's not frozen. But you have to look pretty hard to see the actual motion of the ocean. So, but if you, if you focus on the ocean and look at a sp spot for a while, you will actually see the ocean move, uh, but pretty slowly. So, I mean, the atmosphere is moving 100 times faster. Uh, its um, scales are 10 times bigger. So its time scales are 10 times faster. Uh, so uh, you can see all these mid-latitude westerlies belting along here. Less so in the tropics, but quite a bit of precipitation here. Here, I guess, is the ITCZ, which you're seeing. Um, not much rainfall at the equator here. Mid-latitude westerlies barreling across. OK, anyway, that's a nice, just a nice thing to set scales. 
Uh, as I say, I won't really be talking about the ocean at all, or probably the middle latitude atmosphere. I mean, after 30 years of lecturing, I still don't know how long my lectures will take. <laughs> so uh, so uh, I, I never prepare for a single lecture because it never works. Anyway, um, okay. So this is more or less what I hope to talk about. Uh, a little bit about the general circulation of the atmosphere, more about the theory of the Hadley cell, uh, quite a bit on that, at least the first lecture. Going on to tropical dynamics, a bit about radiative convective equilibrium. Uh, and then I snuck in a little bit about the, um, after Brian's lecture, I snuck in a little section because this is actually purportedly a summer school on multiple equilibrium. I put in a few slides on multiple equilibrium, uh, and then some more about tropical dynamics. And probably, I might or might not get onto this. Oh, and if you're interested in the theory of this, I've written a little book, uh, which you can download here. <laughs> well, there's, there's a big book here, which is 900 pages. Uh, but I've condensed it to a, a, the, the essence so if you go to this directory, http tiny.cc slash valis slash essence, you can actually download the entire book for free. Um, but it won't stop you from buying it because this is actually full of typos and mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> Signs are wrong. So you'll have to buy the, the, actually have to buy the book. Um, turns out you can mostly... Most universities allow you to download the big book, actually, for free. Uh, most British and American universities allow you to download the book for free from the Cambridge University Press. Uh, alas. Anyway, OK, here's the, uh, here's the Moody on overturning circulation, perhaps the most, one of the most prominent features of the atmosphere. So H for Hadley cell, F for Ferrell cell. This is a observations, if you will, or a reanalysis product. The reanalysis product is probably many of you know. It's just you take all the observations possible and you assimilate them into a model. Um, and the reanalysis products are used for the, be the beginning state of a weather forecast. But uh, ECMWF and NCAR have gone, and, J and the Japanese GRA have gone back over 50 or so years and made reanalysis products of, um, of the historical record. And reanalysis products tend to be a little bit, well, they're better than pure observations because they produce fields where there are no observations. But because there are no observations, or very few observations in some places, the reanalysis products tend to also introduce biases by the models, so they're not. So if you actually go to an ob if you're talking to a real meteorologist, somebody who goes around in a plane and or sends up balloons, and you show them this and you say this is observations, they'll probably have a fit. <laughs> they'll say, this isn't observations. Anyway, but we tend to call them observations. Um, Anyway, okay, so this is in um, this southern hemisphere, summer, northern hemisphere, winter. So it's slightly asymmetric, a very large Hadley cell in the winter with rising motion in the southern hemisphere a few degrees south. So the, the winter Hadley cell is, tends to be much stronger than the summer Hadley cell, than feral cells. Uh, apparently going the other way around in the middle latitudes, and then a weak polar cell on either side. Um, this is a zonally averaged zonal wind, uh, and the zonally averaged temperature uh, in red. So the temperature just diminishing from the equator to the pole and diminishing with height. Uh, westerly winds. Uh, 
Meteorologists have the strange habit of calling things westerly when they should be calling them eastward. It's very strange. Uh, it's probably, it probably stems from the fact that people were interested in where the winds come from uh, because that's what determines the weather. But it's odd because you wouldn't say, I'm getting youngerly every day. <laughs> <laughs> Which it wouldn't really make sense, you say. Uh, you know. Anyway, um, we still you should just be familiar with both west, westerly and eastward, uh, and use them interchangeably. So here are the winds. Um, westward winds, uh, all nearly all in the tropics. These are the surface winds. Uh, uh, this is. Uh, Annual average, this is northern hemisphere winter. The bottom's got chopped off. The winds have to average to zero. The surface winds have to average to zero because otherwise there'd be a torque on the earth and a torque on the atmosphere. And then the atmosphere would spin up slightly to make the average values of the surface winds zero. So they have to be average to zero. Uh, once you're away from the surface, they don't have to average to zero, of course. Um, it's the vertical structure of the atmosphere. Um, this is this is um, the Americans have this habit of standardizing things and naming it after America. So uh, this is the US standard atmosphere. Uh, a strange concept. <laughs> uh, you know, like, like a pint of milk or a kilogram, but it's a standard atmosphere. Anyway, and these are actually um, observations, some of them reanalyses. But you see the structure of the atmosphere, the drop of um, temperature diminishing up to about 10 kilometers on average, then about constant increasing slightly because of ozone uh, up to the stratopause and then diminishing slightly. Um, ozone causes is heating the atmosphere up here uh, but it's not the cause of the tropopause. You don't need ozone to have a tropopause. Um, it will still be there without it. Um, we'll hopefully come to that later. Here are some observations um, uh, extra tropics in the green where it's cooler. There's a lower tropopause in the extra tropics. This one up here is the uh, tropics. So the, the tropopause is about 16 kilometers up here, uh, about 10 kilometers on average in the extra tropics, down to about eight uh, in polar regions. <coughs> and it's rather sharp, actually, in places, the tropopause. So we want to explain this structure primarily. Um, there have been lots of attempts over the years. And this is, this is actually from a review article by J.J. Thompson. Um, Thompson was the brother of Kelvin, of whom you've heard, Lord Kelvin. Um, <laughs> But they're both Thompsons. You should reference Kelvin's papers as Thompson. He became a lord later on. So his papers are published as Thompson. Um, people call him Kelvin. <laughs> it's a terrible testament to the British class system, I'm afraid. Uh, what can I say? Uh, and uh, Rayleigh, on the other hand, Lord Rayleigh, of whom you've also heard, was a Rayleigh from the get-go. He was a lord from the get-go. He was the third baron of Rayleigh. So he was a gentleman scientist. He gave up his uh, professorship because he didn't need the hassle and uh, created a lab in his own house or in his own mansion. Did lots of experiments. OK, enough of this. Um, so this is, uh, well, this is a picture that Thompson and Farrell uh, put forward essentially. And here's the Hadley cell. It's a big thing going round and round. 
And Ferrell, of course, is famous for the Ferrell cell. But his vision of the Ferrell cell wasn't really what we imagine it to be now. It was actually this cell sitting underneath the Hadley cell. You can just see it here going round the other way. Uh, and here are the trade winds, middle latitude westerlies. Um, so the main thing that they had was the fact that even Ferrell had was, and Thompson was the fact that the Hadley cell goes all the way from the pole to the equator. Uh, and that was what they couldn't figure out. And later on, it became apparent that the Hadley cell stops at about 30 degrees north. Um, and that's what uh, required explanation. And the explanation for that became clear. Well, much, you know, 100 years later, uh, in the 1960s and then in the 1980s again, uh, and that's what we'll talk about. Why, why does the Hadley cell stop? You might think, and it's perfectly reasonable to think, that the Hadley cell, you know, you're heating things at the equator, it should, air rises, it should just go forwards and sink, and then come back, and it should sink where it's cold, which is the equator, uh, that pole, sorry, and come back, and that's perfectly reasonable. It's not a, it's not a dumb thing to think uh, at all. So why doesn't it do that? Um, but it's a sort of modernish view. This is just uh, cribbed from the book by Wallace and Hobbes uh, of a today's view of Hadley cells, a feral cell going around the other way, tropospheric jet stream here, uh, trade winds going west, converging at or near the equator in the ITCZ, the Intertropical Convergence Zone. And here are our mid-latitude mid -latitude variability of Bioclinic Eddy's weather. Um, and that weather, the cause for the weather, uh, well, people, of course, have always known about the weather, especially British meteorologists, because we get lots of it. Um, uh, the mathematical explanation for the weather came about really in the first half of the 20th century, first through a group in Bergen, the so-called Bjorkney School, who had a sort of phenomenological kind of description of it. Uh, and then in two landmark papers by Edie and Charney um, separately, um, and uh, they each published a, a sole author paper in 48, 48 and 49 um, about the mathematical theory of weather, of bioclinic instability. And they were truly landmark papers. And um, so, okay. So, Probably won't get into that much, but I do want to talk about why the Hadley cell stops um, round about 25 degrees north. Um, okay, and it, well, one reason it stops is that it can't get to the pole without spinning like crazy. Um, and if it spins like crazy, well, it can't spin like crazy for reasons we'll talk about. Um, this, the Earth is spinning about once every 24 hours, something like that. It's actually 23 hours, 56 minutes. Uh, you think it's 24 hours but it's not, it's 23 hours, 56 minutes, because the Earth is rotating around the sun. So a day length, the sol, when the Earth, the sun is above the same place, is, uh, is 24 hours, but the actual rotation of the Earth, the value which gives the Coriolis parameter, is slightly less. Not much difference, because the year is so much longer than the day. Uh, but on Venus... Uh, they're more equal. And the, uh, on Venus, the rotation period is 200 days, but the Sol is actually 100 days. 
because of the... Anyway, and we won't worry about that. Uh, so the Earth is spinning. The, the uh, speed of the surface here is about 400 meters per second. Um, so you, well, omega a at the equator is about 400 meters per second. And here's the angular momentum um, of a parcel of air sitting here, or sitting anywhere, which has a latitude uh, theta. Ben, uh, just to slightly confuse you, I use theta for latitude and potential temperature. Uh, although, in fact, I'm, I'm not duplicating. This is, for those interested in Greek symbols, this is var theta. And it's not like a squiggly theta. So let's suppose, well, as a parcel of air moves from here to here, in the absence of friction, if it's in the free atmosphere, it's going to conserve its angular momentum. So it's going to spin very fast as it gets up to here. I mean, not a, because there's also this cos squared factor. So it's really going to spin like crazy as it gets up to here. So its velocity, if it conserves its angular momentum, and it starts out with velocity of zero here, it's going to go like sine squared theta over, over cos theta. Uh, so it's actually going to become infinite at the pole. Um, and be spinning extraordinarily fast. And I'll show you a graph in a second. Uh, so that would be the angular momentum conserving wind, which is e most easily obtained just from angular momentum conservation. You might think, well, where does that come in the equations of motion? You know, when we write down the normal equations of motion, we don't think about angular momentum. We just think about, you know, the velocity and the stuff like that. So where does it come from? Well, you can actually write down this, the equations of motion in a slightly perhaps more familiar form or perhaps less familiar. This is the zonally symmetric equations of motion. So we're averaging around a, uh, a latitude line, so the pressure averages out. We're assuming there are no eddies here, so we get this equation of motion. If the vertical velocity is small, whoops. If the vertical velocity is small and it's steady, then f plus uh, zeta times v is equal to zero. Uh, if we put that into spherical coordinates, we get this. And then, so one of them has to be zero. We're going to say, uh, if there is a Hadley cell, v is not zero. Uh, so this thing in brackets must be zero, and that gives you the same thing. Uh, U equals omega a sine squared theta. And uh, as I say, well, I can, I can, I guess I can make these slides available if, if people want the slides. Um, you can, you can make them available. So, uh, so that's going to give us some kind of picture of what the Hadley cell looks like. Uh, it's going to rise, presumably, at the equator because it's warm. It's going to, it's going to go polewards. It's going to sink somewhere. We're not, well, we say the subtropics. We don't know that just yet and come back. Now, it's going to come back near the ground uh, there's a lot of friction at the ground. That's where friction is. So the actual zonal flow is going to be weak. But you're going to get a very strong zonal flow here. So you're going to get a large shear between here and here. And if you have a large shear, you know, du by dz is large. And if you've taken an elementary course in meteorology, you know that a large shear gives you a large temperature gradient uh, between uh, north south. So, and um, here's, here's another piece of strange notation which I will use. Um, 
because there used to be, and I still am a half-time oceanographer, and oceanographers have a habit of using B for temperature. Well, B is buoyancy. B for buoyancy. And it's G times a change in potential temperature over the reference potential temperature. It, uh, so very informally, wherever you see B in these lectures, you can imagine it to be temperature. Uh, but it's, it's buoyancy. Um, so du by dz is minus uh, db by d theta or dt by dy. So because du by dz is so large, it means uh, dt by dy is extremely large. So that air is going to get colder and colder. Uh, and eventually, essentially it gets so cold it has to sink. Uh, and it turns out when you do the calculation, which we'll do soon, that it sinks at about 30 degrees north. Uh, so that's certainly one reason why uh, the air sinks uh, in the subtropics and doesn't make it all the way to the pole. If it made it all the way to the pole, it would be, uh, it would be spinning extremely fast. Um, although it turns out that it does make it almost all the way to the pole on Venus, which we may talk to. Uh, in a minute. So, okay. So that's the essential reason. Now I'll do some equations. Um, think about equations. Um, here's some equations. Um, I think it's, you need the equations to do the calculation. Um, at the end of the day, you should always be able to explain your equations in words, which, or I think you should be able to explain your equations in words. It's a good thing to try and, you know, you've done some calculation, you should be able to explain it. Even if, you know, you, you won't necessarily be able to uh, do the quantitative calculation and you need the equations. You can't just explain things in words from the get-go, that's kind of, Pity, you know, very, very, very nonsense if you do that. Uh, but really, you need to. So I'll try and do that in this lecture. Uh, so even if you don't follow, and I always find it impossible to follow equations in lectures, uh, almost impossible. Um, the, or the details of them, you have to take them a little bit on trust. But I'll try to explain them in words. Um, so what we're going to do is suppose that the atmosphere is forced by thermal relaxation to a, some particular radiative equilibrium temperature. So if there were no motion, the temperature would be theta E, potential temperature theta E, and it would diminish like Y squared, as you, it would diminish as you go polewards like this. So this, would, this is the radiative equilibrium temperature. But the actual temperature from thermal wind, uh, because we know what the velocity is, so the temperature, uh, I'm calling it B here, uh, is slave to the wind. The temperature doesn't get to choose what it is. It's, we know what the wind is. We so presume it's in thermal wind balance, so the temperature is slave to that wind. So. Um, so that gives us, we've determined what the wind is from uh, thermal wind balance and angular momentum conservation. Uh, the wind is given by uh, wherever it was, this guy. So you're assuming that surface wind is zero? Yeah, surface wind is zero, exactly. And it's a uniform shear. Uh, so that gives us the wind. So that actually gives us what the temperature is. Um, and that temperature can't fall below the radiative equilibrium temperature. I mean, it starts out higher. This temperature is going to, is going to fall quite rapidly. Uh, when it falls, it's going to fall such that eventually it's going to be colder than the radiative equilibrium temperature, and then it's going to sink. 
Um, and if you do that calculation, you get this. Um, and I'll show you those in this slide. And there's a, there's a slight complication, uh, I'll come to it in a second, but so radiative equilibrium temperature is a red curve. So that's going like this, falling quite rapidly. The angular momentum temperature is this blue line. Uh, so this is the temperature given by the angular momentum conservation, the, the actual temperature, uh, which is slaved to the velocity field. So that goes like this, mm. bum, 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 bum. And here, where it crosses over, that is what we presume to be the edge of the Hadley cell. And then after that, the actual temperature uh, in this model just follows the radiative equilibrium temperature. So there's just motion here. And then, um, on average, over the entire Hadley cell, uh, if the Hadley cell is sort of self-contained, um, the average radiative equilibrium temperature will have to equal the average uh, actual temperature because overall the atmosphere is neither being heated nor cooled. So the average uh, of the radiative equilibrium temperature has to equal the average of the actual temperature. And that gives us uh, the absolute value of the temperature, you know, whether how hot it is or how cold it is. So the average, so, uh, so that gives you a little bit of, uh, of mathematics to do. It's just a calculation that you have. I'm not going to, can't do here. Uh, go away and do it. It's in, it's in my uh, book. Always. And, uh, and you get this to be the um, edge of the Hadley cell. And this particular calculation was done in a paper by Held and Howe. Um, it was really Arthur Howe's PhD thesis, in a way. Um, the idea of an angular momentum conservation uh, being a major part of the Hadley cell actually comes from a paper by um, Ed Schneider, E.K. Schneider, in about 1977. I should have referenced them here. So that gives you the edge of the Hadley cell, and it's parameterized by uh, this non-dimensional number here. Uh, delta theta h is the temperature difference between the equator and the pole of the radiative equilibrium. Omega is the um, rotation rate of the Earth. A is the radius of the Earth. Uh, so this is like a, it's, a, it's called a thermal Rosby number. Uh, and here the, um, this is what it looks like again. Same plot here. This is actually what the wind looks like. And you can see well, I've only plotted it from zero to about 45. If we continue with the angular momentum conservation, well, you can see already it's 300 meters per second. Um, never gets that far, of course, because it stops, uh, stops around about here. Um, and uh, Ed Schneider actually thought that well, introduced partly the notion of cumulus friction, which would slow it down, uh, that the clouds would be providing a lot of friction and slowing it down. But in fact, um, that's believed to not to be so important these days. Um, you can then, you can also calculate the Hadley cell strength from this model. Um, and uh, to do that in a simple way, you can suppose that the 
in the thermodynamic equation of rough balances. W d theta by dz is theta e minus theta over tau. So this is the thermal forcing on the right-hand side. Theta is the actual temperature. Theta sub e is the equilibrium temperature. So that gives you an estimate for what W is if you know what the height is. And the height is around about the height of the tropopause, which we haven't said what that is. Um, that's a, a separate calculation I hope to come to later on. Uh, then you go through a little bit of mathematics. Then you get this estimate for the vertical velocity. So this is the vertical velocity at the equator? This is the vertical, well, this sort of, this, yeah, at the equator. Well, this is an overturning circulation. This is the strength of the... So uh, heating, the equatorial heating doesn't come into play at all? Well, it does in a sense. Well, sort of. Uh, it all comes into, I mean, here's, this is an estimate for the strength of this psi. So psi is such that d psi dy is w minus d psi dz is v. And I will show you, I'll show you once what, how the moist hydler cell, this is my only slide I think on the moist hydler cell, but I think that Simona might talk a little bit more about this tomorrow or you'll hear more about it. The Hadley cell, in this picture at least, and you can argue with the picture, is not driven, if you will, by moisture or convection. It's not. The Hadley cell doesn't arise because we have convection at the equator. Uh, the Hadley cell arises because there's a differential heating between the equator uh, and higher latitudes. Uh, so if, if everything were the same temperature at the equator, we wouldn't have a Hadley cell. We might just have convection everywhere. We wouldn't, we wouldn't have a large-scale overturning circulation. So the Hadley cell is driven, if, if you will. Driven is a fraught word in, in our field. Uh, some people... You know, what, what does it mean? Does it mean controlled by or is it the mechanism? Think about who drives the car. The driver drives the car, but he's not providing the power. But oftentimes, use it in different ways. But, uh, but the Hadley cell is not driven by convection or by moisture, but they make a difference. It's really driven by the, the differential forcing between the equator and higher latitudes. So here, for example, this red line again is the temp is a solution, uh, the actual temperature solution, because that's slaved to the velocity field. Now, uh, theta e here is the radiative relaxation temperature, the temperature it's relaxing back to in the dry model, and you can see in the dry model it's not. The actual temperature is not all that much different from the radiative equilibrium temperature. Now, if we add moisture, moisture is releasing a lot of heat at the equator, less so at high latitudes. If we want to put moisture into this framework, we can sort of imagine an equivalent radiative equilibrium temperature which takes into account the release of heat due to moisture. By increasing the radiative equilibrium temperature near the equator, which is sort of uh, uh, a simple way of, in, uh, of uh, including the effects of moisture. So this is the radiative equilibrium temperature that I've just invented if we have a moist model. So the solution temperature is still exactly the same. So there's a much larger difference between the solution temperature and the radiative equilibrium temperature if we have a moist model or if the atmosphere is moist. Therefore, we expect the circulation to be actually much stronger in a moist model than in a dry model. 
And I think actually some people are doing a projects related to the Hadley cell with and without moisture. So, uh, so it would be good. One thing that you'll be able to look at is whether it is indeed strong, more strongly. And was there a question? It's been set by uh, it's been set by my imagination in this in this in this plot. I'm just saying that when we have moisture, it will be releasing heat to the equator. Therefore, uh, the equivalent radiative equilibrium temperature would be higher. Um, Well, it, in a sense, it's partly because the the actual and probably shouldn't take this too seriously, but the there's this equal area construction, so that the the actual solution has to be, um, the area on this side has to be equal to the area on that side. So if the, um, if theta E star is higher on this side, it has to be lower on this side, or the red line would actually adjust to make it so. Um, but maybe we can talk about that later if it's, if it's not entirely clear. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Is it, uh, Hardy's cell is not driven by convection, but the Hardy's cell uh, I mean, uh, is driven by a uh, very general difference yeah. of uh, convection. Yeah, so, that's right, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, why, so. Why are you not driven, but yeah. affected by? Yeah, affected by, certainly, yeah. Yeah, that's right. But if we had a dry model, yeah, dry model. we certainly get hard, we also get a Hadley cell. Maybe radiation difference. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I'm not saying it's not important. I'm just saying it's not the the driving factor, if you will. In, in I mean, moisture, moisture model. Uh, Hadley cell is affected by radiation heat release. Yeah. Different differential heat. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. I mean, this, this, you know, whatever I called it here, this theta e is what I'm is a proxy for all of the heating. Uh, so we're calling it the radiative equilibrium temperature, but this is a proxy for all the heating which you might have. So we call it the radiative equilibrium temperature, but if you want to include the effects of moisture in it, you would just you would modify this theta e if you wanted to try and uh, fake it uh, with a with a dry model. So, uh, so even a dry model on the right hand side of the thermodynamic equation, there would still be a Q. Even the dry model need to radiate it. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the circulation is stronger. So I'm arguing here that moisture is enhancing and not causing the Hadley cell. Um, and, uh, and perhaps we'll hear more about this uh, tomorrow, I don't know, and, uh, and next week. Um, all right. So let's just go back to this guy. Here, the... Uh, Shear is increasing like crazy. Um, so, what else might stop the Hadley cell is that this flow becomes unstable because the shear is so large. And that's, uh, in a sense, that's the traditional view um, of why the Hadley cell stops. Um, and that's discussed in Lorenz's um, 
monograph. There's a famous monograph by Lorenz in 1967. Uh, it's, it's, it's well worth looking at. It's very hard to obtain. Um, called the general circulation of the atmosphere. It's been out of print for years. Uh, but it's a nice sort of, it's a transition to the modern view. Um, talks about bioclinic instability, the Hadley cell, um, uh, and so on. But it, at that time, he doesn't know about all these modern concepts that Insect talked about yesterday, pseudo-momentum, blah, blah. Or even the cause of the Westerlies uh, was not understood at that time. But it's, uh, uh, but the notion there was that the temperature gradient between the equator and the pole was sufficiently large, and they did know this because Edie and Charney had done this, was sufficiently large that the middle attitudes would become unstable, and therefore you couldn't get a Hadley cell going all the way from the equator to the pole. Uh, so, where are we? Here we are. Again, I won't go th through it because you need an entire course. Uh, in my GFD course at Exeter and the one I used to teach at Princeton, we had a 12-week GFD course. And at the end of it, we were about to get on to bioclinic instability. Uh, <laughs> Sarah probably remembers. She, I don't know whether you took it from me or somebody else. From me? OK. And um, so, uh, and then we get to that in the second term. So obviously, you're not going to, I can't do the derivation. But I'm just going to say that when the shear gets to be sufficiently large, so sort of explaining it in words, um, it will become unstable. And. Uh, so that shear, uh, there's, a, there's a formula for it. It depends uh, in particular on the rotation rate and the latitude. So bioclinic instability is inhibited at low latitudes. Uh, it's inhibited uh, for two reasons, two connected reasons. One, the Coriolis parameter itself is small because you're close to the equator. And one, the beta effect, beta is, a, is the FDY, is large. And on the sphere, beta is 2 omega over a cosine of latitude. Um, so that becomes, so that's large at the, um, so, this is the threshold for bioclinic instability. This guy, very large here. This is the actual angular momentum conserving wind, our solution. So when we get here, which is uh, about 20 degrees, the angular momentum conserving wind, this, the shear is sufficiently large that it will become bioclinically unstable. Uh, and then the Hadley cell will terminate because uh, you'll get eddies and all sorts of things. Um, and that's the latitude at which that occurs. Uh, N is a measure of the stratification. H is the height of the tropopause. Omega is the rotation rate. A is the um, radius of the Earth. And you can see that as the rotation rate diminishes, or the size of the planet diminishes, uh, the Hadley cell extent will increase. So that's another thing. And that is true also uh, in our, so this is an, in our model, which was purely angular momentum conserving. Here it goes like just one over omega a. Uh, here it's going like one over omega a to the one half power. But these scalings, uh, you might even, 
you guys doing the Hadley cell experiment, you might even be able to test uh, which one actually works. Um, well, it's, it's very hard to actually, to give you fair warning, it's hard to test these things <laughs> in a real, it, well, even in an idealized model like ISCA, it's hard to actually test things because the results are, will always end up being ambiguous and it kind of looks like this, but it's got a little bit of this in it. Uh, so it doesn't quite work as well as it. Oh, well, this is using the Phillips model of bioclinic instability, which is the, the Phillips two-layer model of bioclinic instability. So you have to have a, so if you have a beta, there's a critical shear for instability. Um, that's where that's come from. That's the logic down. That suggests that we have to be on the sphere. Yes, okay, it's another ambiguity. Okay. <laughs> uh, Yes, it does, actually, because um, beta is this. Uh, it has a latitude in it. So that's where beta is. So I've used this value of beta uh, in here. So I replace beta by 2 omega a cos theta over. Uh, and then I use that. And so beta and F get kind of conflated. So that's why there's a... a it looks as though it's an F scaling. It looks as though it's an F scaling, yeah. Uh, but there are other... But it does raise the other points that in other models of bioclinic instability, there's no critical shear. Like in the ED model, there's no critical shear. So nonetheless, there is... So the exact calculation, uh, well, the calculation is not exact, I should say, but the notion that the, it will become bioclinically unstable. Uh, and, uh, and even, perhaps as a slight aside, um, in a sense for the professionals, the Hadley cell may sink before it becomes truly bioclinically unstable you may have a bioclinic zone at higher latitudes, uh, which is uh, creating Rosby waves, which are uh, propagating uh, equator wood. This is the full equation. These Rosby waves are breaking here and causing the Hadley cell to, to sink even before you get into the bioclinic zone. So, um, so it's a little bit complicated to do the exact calculation. And that's why, we, that's why we have models. Uh, you can't do everything with pencil and paper. Um, show you a few numerical simulations. Uh, this is a dry Hadley cell um, in a zonally symmetric model. Uh, so not 3D. So you have a Hadley cell. It's relatively weak, but it exists and it, and it terminates about 30 degrees either side of the equator. This is what happens when we actually put, make it three-dimensional and put eddies into it, bioclinic eddies. You get a much stronger Hadley cell. It's slightly narrower, I would say. The edge of the Hadley cell is slightly narrower than it is here slightly lower latitude, and you get these feral cells on either side. Um, this is the zonal wind in these simulations. This is a zonal symmetric calculation. So the zonal symmetric cal calculation, the dashed line here is the angular momentum conserving wind from the calculation. The solid line um, is the wind from the simulation. And you can see in the zonally symmetric case, it almost is following the angular momentum conserving wind uh, until, uh, until you're about 30 degrees north. In the three-dimensional simulation, it's not because the middle latitudes, bioclinic instability is in a sense sucking out angular momentum. 
uh, transferring angular momentum uh, out, sort of in the, in the way that we heard uh, in yesterday's lecture from, uh, from INSIC. Well, here are the two pictures together. So, um, I guess I should break, actually, maybe I should break now for five minutes before talking about the seasonal cycle. Yeah, take a few questions before we, Brian. Okay. Okay. I thought I'd only given you two, okay. but uh, <laughs> let's talk about that. So, yeah. So, so one, one is a thermodynamic idea that, that, the, that if you conserve angular momentum, then the thermal wind, the, the, the shear gets really large because the winds have to spin up really fast as you move toward the pole. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I said. It gets too cold, it has to sink in, this, in a. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and that's one. That's one. Okay. And, then, and then there's this notion that. Uh, hang on, now. what was number two? So, so number two <coughs> is the notion that, that the, the, this, because the winds spin up very fast, they become, become very clinically unstable. Yep. Right? So, so the angular momentum. That's right, because you, but then this is, this you've got this term. Right, but this. Uh, and then this is, a slight, this is a slight variation on that. So, so this is 2.5. This is 2.5, right. 2.5 is the <coughs> instability elsewhere has essentially the same effect because it's going, to, it's, going, it's going to create these waves that will break in the region that otherwise would have been happy to. Do yes, that's, that's right. But it's too, yes, it's still too. Due to bioclinic instability. So it's a variation on that theme. So the, the one thread that seems to connect all three or all 2.5 is rotation rate, right? Yeah. So the one thing that can, can sort of kill all these explanations is just to slow down the, yep. the rotation. Yep. Rate. Uh, exactly. Lecture two. Okay. Yes. All right. So we, we're on the same page. We're, yeah, we're on the same page. Yeah. Yeah. Any other. Uh, and it's on different, right? Pardon? The scaling law, yeah, that's right. It, the scaling, in, indeed, yes, the scaling law is different uh, to the extent that you believe the scaling law for this bioclinic instability. It goes like 1 over omega a to the 1 half power. Um, and here, it's going like 1 over omega a. So the scaling law is different, but it's still going. And Differentiating between those scaling laws, I don't, may, I don't think it's been truly successfully done in the literature. Yeah, I mean, people have, people have argued, oh, you know, um, this, that, and the other, but it's not. A lot of, you know, it, it's, it's a, the, the real Earth, unfortunately, or well, the Earth doesn't behave like a real theory sometimes. <laughs> So uh, it's, it's a little bit ambiguous as to, I mean, probably both effects are, are, are important. It's not necessarily an either or. And uh, furthermore, in the seasonal cycle, um, you may have slightly different scalings for the summer versus the winter. In fact, the seasonal, which we'll come to in a minute, the Hadley cell is almost, is strongly seasonal. So to even talk about the annually averaged Hadley cell is, is missing half of the story because, you know, perhaps we sh should really be talking about the summer Hadley cell and the winter Hadley cell. And it really tries to go fairly f quickly from one to the other. And, uh, and that transition is part of what makes up the monsoon, which we'll hear about more later. And OK, uh, yeah, you, because, uh, sorry. Yeah, most of it is a geometrical argument. Um, there's, why is coming, here you're just going to have to do the, 
go through the equations. But y comes in in a number of ways. Uh, I mean, f, if you do it, f is 2 omega sine theta, which is like y, uh, because for small angles, uh, sine theta is theta. So, you know, f is f naught plus beta y. So it comes in there. Uh, and it comes in in the fact that we're on a sphere. So it's coming in both dynamically. This is sort of a dynamical argument and a geometric argument just because we're on a sphere. So you get y's for different reasons. You could actually do the problem. And if you're interested, you can look it up. Actually, in my big book, <laughs> not in the little book. I did the, uh, the argument in Carti purely Cartesian geometry on the beta plane, and then you lose the spherical effect. Uh, but you still have this effect. Uh, so it comes in in, in in a couple of different ways. Yeah, yeah. 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 It depends what you mean by drive, of course. I mean, you can, you can. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, there's, there's, there's downward motion. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, there probably is, because um, yeah, this is the same. This actually, this same argument comes up in in oceanography. Actually, um, people talk about the meridional overturning circulation of the ocean being driven by convection uh, off of Greenland or off of. Uh, but yeah, if you take I mean, here's a, here's a cloud. You've got, you've got a lot of upward motion here. You've got downward motion on either side. You've got a Hadley cell like this. And we think of vertical motion in the atmosphere as being small. If you're actually in the core have a strong cumulonimbus. The vertical velocity here can be 10 meters per second. Uh, can be really large in the middle of a cumulus, cumulonimbus. Uh, and you get this uh, compensating subsidence on either side of it, which people talk about. Uh, so this overturning circulation is not just a consequence of that. You've got all this downwards motion which is much weaker on either side. Uh, but you take the net effect, there'll be some uh, circulation like that. Yeah, the back, John. So Jeff and I both uh, had, uh, were grad students together, and uh, the same supervisor, a guy called John Green. And when John would explain he would emphasize the pattern of surface winds, right? So that if you've got barophilic eddies in middle latitudes, they think they're Rossby waves in the tropics, and that leads to momentum transfer out of, out of the uh, tropics yeah. to easterlies. Right, and yes. And the ageostropic flow connected with the surface wind induces an overturning circulation. Now, this, yes. of course, was all yeah. before and yeah, yeah. So what do you, what's your take on that? There is a, an element of truth to that. There, there is an element of truth to that. And then really, I think that is... Uh, you don't start off from the tropics, you start off from middle latitudes. Yes, I suppose that is sort of this equation. 
that these are providing a, uh, an angular momentum source. They're sucking momentum out from the tropics. And if you, you can create, and that actually gives you a much stronger Hadley cell. So the Hadley cell in the zonally symmetric, the held and how Hadley cell, whoops, where are we? Let's go to the simulation. The interesting thing is that they assume that the flow is, you know, they, they can assume U equals zero at the ground. Yeah. Whereas Green's perspective was not to do, yeah. Trade wind. The, the group have right? Yeah, so that's right. Uh, yeah. 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 The, I think, in my view, the held how Hadley cell is way too weak. The held how Hadley cell is not. The, the annually averaged held how Hadley cell is far too weak. It does not conform with uh, the real Hadley cell, even on the even on the annual average. So I kind of regard. Well, my view of the Held and Howe model is that it is a model for the ideal Hadley cell on a planet in which there is n are no eddies. And its contribution is to show that the Hadley cell actually sinks at about 30 degrees north. So that, the, uh, so that I think of it as in the same spirit of, of these models. And it shows you that this ideal Hadley cell cannot exist. Uh, but it's not a realistic model of the actual Hadley cell, although it may have do better in winter than in summer. But maybe we should talk about that after the, uh, after the break. So we'll still have a five minute break. <laughs> but now we'll come back a quarter of. But keep the questions going because that's good. Your plot, where you have the crossover between the baroclinic instability argument and the, yeah, that, and the angular momentum conserving wind. Yeah. 